Okay, so let's continue the discussion about optical flow. We have talked about what the optical flow is and what are some of the attractive things about estimating optical flow that potentially we could estimate optical flow at uh, uh, on very high speed motions and high dynamic range scenarios and uh, potentially also because events carry the information of uh, moving edges, we would be focusing our computational effort into these informative regions on the image plane. Now let's actually uh, dive in and take a look at what are some of the proposed solutions or principles to try to estimate optical flow from events. In doing so, it's good to, to read papers and to have some questions uh, in mind um, to, to try to understand the paper and the method. So one of the uh, important things to us is what is the key principle? What is the main idea of the method? Why it's um, allowing to estimate optical flow from events? And very closely related is uh, what are the assumptions? What is the additional knowledge uh, that is used? So it could be that the flow is uh, locally constant. It could be that um, uh, flow is uh, assumed to be uh, taken from, from data, so data-driven, or the assumption could be brightness constancy that holds. Yeah, there are many different ones. <clears throat> what is being optimized? That's a different, it's closely related question, but so most uh, of, uh, of the time, optical flow is computed as, uh, suppose as an optimization problem, we want to optimize for something, what to optimize for, a variational uh, objective function or you want to optimize for uh, a plane fitting cost or optimize for some contrast and or sharpness it's it's important to keep this in mind and see if there is a relationship between the different methods and then the creep principle is um, then you could go and, and, and describe them and this is more uh, uh, well known for uh, optical flow methods for frame-based cameras, they have been kind of uh, categorized or classified into different methods. If they are differential, if they are based on correlation or based on, on, on the face. Um, ideally, we would like to have also like a classification or taxonomy of methods for event-based vision and to identify which family or which principles are, are best. <coughs> In our case, it's also important to, when we read the paper, to see what's the representation for the events that is being used, right? This is something that we discussed, that when you have um, a system and you have events coming in and something coming out like a pose, or in this case, optical flow, sometimes uh, the event representation or that is coming in the input or the internal one, it depends on, on the processing and depends on the output. Uh, so it's interesting to take a look at the different papers and see how the event representation changes from one to, to another and how this representation influences the, the way the events are processed. Uh, another important question is what is the inference mechanism to compute uh, flow given the events? Because we have seen that we could think of an algorithm as taking uh, once, for example, it has been uh, initialized and has some state if the algorithm has some internal state and then an event comes in or a group of event comes in and we would like to know how to assimilate the information from the new events with the internal state to produce an output and also to update the state <clears throat> so the inference mechanism it uh, refers to uh, this this process of events coming in assimilating and comparing with internal state and producing an output in neural networks, it would be like inference or testing phase, and which is different from a training uh, stage. Then regarding the, the algorithm or the method, the output, there are different characteristics. We can classify algorithms as if uh, taking a look, for example, at the output. Does the output to produce uh, the full flow or just uh, can only estimate the normal component of the flow? Uh, does it produce dense optical flow? So flow for every pixel on the image plane and some time, <clears throat> or is it sparse? Is uh, vectors that are only computed at a specific uh, points in space-time? 
for specific pixels. And that's, the, that's what it means by dense and sparse. And regarding the method, it could be event by event or could be processing packets of events. Typically, we know that an event doesn't carry enough information, so it has to um, be aggregated with some other events. And the question is whether this aggregation of information happens because we uh, input some events alone and they do not need for any internal state or because we input events one by one and they are fusing with some additional knowledge or internal state and then produces an output. Uh, another category would be whether the method is bio-inspired or not. So there are some methods that are bio-inspired and they try to understand what's the, the uh, physiological processes, so try to make algorithms that are <clears throat> compatible with uh, neuroscience, what, what is known the human visual system. Um, another question would be whether the method exploits polarity or not. Typically you exploit the x, y coordinate, yes, and, and the time, and the u quantize time, the timestamps, but uh, some algorithms uh, do not use polarity. And well, there is a question, if, is this useful? Is, or is it not useful? There are many different types of, of methods and there are many considerations or characteristics. And finally, in, in reading a paper or trying to analyze a method, it's uh, after this process of analyzing, uh, analyzing the, um, the, the method and the experiments, then you more or less come up with a better idea of what the algorithm is doing or what the method it's, it's doing. And you uh, hopefully kind of summarize into advantages and disadvantages if you have to compare and contrast these methods with other ones. So this is a, a very exhaustive list. Uh, maybe there are many things here and we could go through for every every algorithm, but that's kind of quite intense. Um, I don't pretend to go over all this for, for the different papers that we are, or the methods that we are going to, to review. So I will just uh, highlight the most interesting things that, that I think are about the methods. In the survey paper, there are some of these uh, considerations. And for example, we can see that there is a table um, in section 4.2, uh, where some of these criteria are considered. So on the rows are the different uh, papers and methods uh, with their first authors. And then these are the references from the paper. And then, for example, there are four columns here asking whether it's uh, estimating a normal flow or full flow. Is it sparse or dense? Uh, is it uh, model based or uh, it has a neural network? So it's data driven and whether it's uh, bio inspired or not. So this is a multi-dimensional uh, problem or a classification with many criteria. Um, I think the best is not so much to to be uh, very picky about this, but to rather understand what's the, the principle and the key ideas behind them and how you could combine one or the other. But, so let's take a look at some of the of the methods. Um, one of the earliest methods for computing uh, event-based optical flow is what basically try to adapt what we already know from event-based methods, and that's a popular one. It's is the Lucas Canada one, uh, which was invented in the in the eighties um, of the last century. Um, so recall the brightness constancy that we have seen in a previous video. Basically, it says that uh, for a short period of time we can assume that corresponding points uh, or points that correspond to the same uh, point in, in, in the object are those that follow trajectories that have uh, constant brightness. And if we take the, the, the derivative of that equation, and then we come up with this differential form that says that the, um, <clears throat> the spatial and the temporal derivatives of the brightness are related by, by the optical flow, and they should be zero. And we have exploited this equation already in the event generation model to go from the standard one, or so the nonlinear one, to the linearized version of it. 
Okay, so we already saw in, a, in an earlier video that basically this is a scalar equation in two unknowns, and the two unknowns are the uh, x and y velocity uh, of, so x and y component of the velocity, the optical flow. And two unknowns, one equation, there are not enough uh, equations. This is an underdetermined system uh, at every pixel. So what we uh, do is a or what Lucas Canade proposed to do um, was to assume that the that the flow is locally constant, um, and basically instead of considering a single pixel, you could consider all the neighbors of the pixel, and it would be like uh, nine pixels sharing the same optical flow. Then now you have nine equations and two unknowns, and in principle. Uh, um, then you have to analyze the system of equations to see if, if a solution exists, but you have now more equations than unknowns, so it'll be possible to find a least square solution. Okay, uh, so the event camera does not provide brightness, and that's uh, kind of uh, an indirect or the one of the unconventional parts of event cameras, that they do not provide brightness. Um, as a standard camera would, but rather the temporal derivative. So remember what the frame-based camera does. A frame-based camera will acquire one frame, and then after some time it will acquire another frame. And if we look at what are the quantities in the brightness constancy, the spatial derivative, we we know how to compute it with just like the Sobel gradient mask on any of the frames. And for the temporal derivative, what uh, it's often used is that you take the two frames and you subtract them, and that's kind of an approximation for the temporal derivative. It's like finite difference uh, approximation to the temporal derivative. So in, in principle, if you have two frames, uh, you could compute uh, the spatial gradient and the temporal derivative for every pixel uh, on the image plane, right? Even though there is there is kind of like a blind time between the frames, and these two frames could be very far apart in time, that, so that this is not a good approximation to the temporal derivative. But in principle, with two frames, you are able to compute these two quantities, and the only unknown is the, the optical flow. In the case of event-based cameras, it's not the same because uh, it's very uh, difficult, or at least the event cameras don't give you the spatial gradient. Uh, they give you kind of like a temporal derivative. So what was it proposed? Oh, well, the idea that was kind of in, in this paper uh, reference uh, at, the, at the bottom of the slide is, uh, well, instead of using the brightness L, let's use the increment image of events. So it means that, you know, that pixels wise, we can accumulate um, the event polarities, uh, and that would be an image like this one. So on every pixel, we accumulate for a short period of time, uh, the polarities, so brightness, bright means that there was positive events, dark means there were negative events. Um, and then use this as an image that we, where we plug in the Lucas Canadi algorithm. That's basically the idea. And then to obtain a, a flow. Obviously, this is not the same because this is not assuming constant uh, brightness constancy. Now, what we are assuming is uh, constancy of uh, of this uh, balance of event polarities, which is kind of the increment image. So it's kind of like a second derivative rather than a than a than a first derivative. But anyway, it, it was one of the earliest uh, approaches to try to reutilize what we've known from frame based uh, vision to apply to events. So events are converted into um, frames, and these frames are used to, to apply to the Lucas Canade algorithm. Quite straightforward and more or less it kind of works. Um, later in some paper that we will see, there was some uh, um, critique that raised uh, important points is that, that at every events, uh, at every pixel, there are not that many events happening. And we are using these events to try to approximate uh, derivatives. These are the derivatives in space and time that are used uh, for uh, approximating, uh, well, the coefficients of, of the equations. 
And the problem is that um, these methods, they do not work so well. The finite uh, difference approximations, they are not so good because uh, uh, the derivatives, they are not so reliable if there is not enough data. So if you want to have like a reliable derivatives, then you need to consider longer periods of time um, and therefore you're introducing latency and it's not so good overall. So instead what they uh, observe is that methods that work directly on the event cloud uh, means that not taking derivatives uh, or finite difference approximations then they, these are preferred. And we will see some of these methods. Actually the next one it's already one of these methods. So later by the same authors, uh, uh, Riyad Benosma in Paris and, and colleagues, uh, they proposed uh, to estimate optical flow by local plane fitting. And this is something that we kind of has already seen in a motivation example. So the idea is the following, um, to fit uh, local planes uh, in space to the point cloud of events. And why? Why would that be a good strategy? Well, you know that when, when an edge is moving, it produces a trail of events that resembles a surface. Um, and then what we could do is we could try to approximate the surface by fitting a plane, which is like the first order um, fit that you could do. And then um, get the velocity from the coefficients of, of such a plane. So this is the idea. We have uh, x and y, so we have horizontally, this is the image plane, and time goes up for every pixel x, y, um, this called sigma e, so the surface of active events at point x and y is just the, the time. This is what it's called later in the literature, the time surfaces. And you could plot it as being uh, a continuous surface like this, but in reality is much more noisy and this is an example from, from a single edge that was moving from from left to right in the x coordinate it's a, it was like a vertical edge moving to, to, to the right and time goes up and you see this is a, a much noisier point cloud um, but what we can do is we, we try to fit planes and then obtain so the plane fitting is described by this equation so you're trying to find the homogeneous coordinates of the plane so the a b c d coefficients such that when multiplied by these events with coordinates x y p i are the x and y and t is the timestamp and a one well you're trying to minimize the uh, algebraic distance of uh, the points to the planes to obtain a candidate plane and then um, the surface, the gradient of the surface of active events is related to the normal flow, the flow of the, what the, the optical flow. And basically, this can be obtained from the coefficients of the plane. So, if you have a point cloud like this, what then you could do is like you could take a small space time neighborhood and try to fit a plane here, obtain the coefficients, and from the coefficients of the plane, obtain the, the velocity. But well, ideally, you have to analyze the whole uh, point cloud. So you would do this as every event comes, and you will have this neighborhood, this small uh, uh, local plane fitting, and to fit the plane to the to the entire surface. In this case, it it's quite regular and it's a big edge, so we, we could fit like a single plane to it. But the idea is to do this locally in uh, in small neighborhoods. So this algorithm, uh, it's not taking derivative, it's trying to actually fit uh, a model to the to the point cloud. And it's therefore preferred over those that compute derivatives and try to amplify noise, but it can only determine the normal component of the flow. Um, this is also interesting because this kind of algorithm is one of the earliest ones that was trying to do things event-based and not kind of departing from from adapting uh, methods from frame-based vision. Um, it also sparked the concept of event lifetime, which is kind of the 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 time that uh, an edge takes to to traverse uh, one pixel. Hmm. 
So what is interesting about this method, as I said, is that it's different from frame-based method. It's that um, there are not two frames that are being analyzed and then the output of these two frames is the optical flow. Here, what is being analyzed is the, the point cloud of events. You are reasoning of the events in terms of uh, space-time in geometry. And as every event comes, then we are taking a small space-time neighborhood around it and trying to, to, to fit the plane. It's, it's quite different from frame-based. Okay, let's move on to 2015. And then there was this paper that it's um, kind of a bi-inspired uh, approach to estimate optical flow. And the idea is that um, they want to convolve the, the events with the space-time filters that are tuned for selected uh, directions. Um, so they are direction selective filters and these are kind of manually uh, manually set, these filters. And this is an idea that is based on uh, biology, on physiological um, studies. So neuroscience of how the, the human visual system works. Um, so if we want to pass the events to a filter bank, then we have to build uh, these uh, the responses of the filters, right? And the idea is to build motion direction sensitive filters from separable components to make the convolutions or to make the computations faster. So imagine that we have um, um, some events and there is an edge that is moving uh, towards the left. So time runs up and the x-coordinate goes to the right. So these are past events, and this is the current event. And vertical is the temporal axis, and horizontal is the uh, space axis, is x. So for simplicity, y is not shown. The idea would be to pass this to a filter bank and try to detect this trail of events. Because when an edge is moving, it's leaving a trail of events, something that would be like in the picture here, right? The edge is moving to the to the world, to the right, and uh, if you consider what happens at this coordinate y equals 60, then we see that events are are leaving like a trail of 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 events, and we would like to detect this. So what we do is that we convolve these events with some filters that look like this. They are tuned to particular. Uh, space-time directions and hopefully to get maximum response from one of the filters so there's not this is just one filter where here what it's plotted are the um, that the, this response is obtained as the sum of two space-time responses one with um, temporal biphasic filter and, uh, and an even uh, spatial response with Gabor filters in space and there is another Gabor and this other one has a monophasic in time and an odd filter in uh, odd response in space so when you add this two then you get this spatial temporal filter important thing to notice is that we are trying to line up right this trail of events with with the direction selectivity of the filter hopefully so that the filter will tell us that there is a maximum response. Obviously, there are many more filters in the bank and for others, uh, it would be the response uh, of, uh, of this input signal will not be uh, as prominent, it will not be maximal. But hopefully the, the idea is that as the signal goes through these filter banks and you have uh, many outputs and then you identify um, in which what's the space-time characteristic of the input by looking at the output of the filter bank with the highest response. And what are the results? Where well, here are some tests on translation or on rotational motion. And um, yeah, they show that it's possible to estimate uh, from the events some, some vectors. Um, in, in this case, even though in, because there is not enough texture, then it's only uh, estimated the, the normal flow. Uh, but if texture is more complicated, then it can estimate the, the full flow.
Okay, let's move on to 2016, and there is this uh, simultaneous optical flow and image uh, intensity uh, reconstruction, image estimation. We have already seen this in the topic of image reconstruction. Now we will take a bit uh, different look at it from the point of view of optical flow. So uh, the paper proposes to process a volume of events um, um, estimate at the same time the flow and the brightness that best explain this, this volume of events. And this volume of events is represented kind of using internally a voxel grid. What's the idea behind it? The idea is to uh, take the equations that uh, we know that are the re relating the optical flow uh, and the brightness and, and the events and try to penalize the and deviations from these equations not being satisfied and also assume uh, some smooth solution so the flow u and the um, and the brightness l because otherwise uh, um, these uh, very strange solutions will you, you could have like fractalized solution so so there are two parts it's like any variational good variational optimization problem it has a data fidelity part and a smoothness or regularizer and this is basically how you write it mathematically you want to minimize over uh, the set of vector fields u so optical flow and the scalar field l for the brightness and this cost function has different terms right the smoothness terms because we want the solution to be smooth and this smoothness is measured using classical norms such as the L1 norm and that allows for uh, kind of sharp uh, edge discontinuities uh, better than the two norm so we are requiring the velocity uh, uh, in space so the flow uh, uh, the spatial and temporal derivatives uh, to be smooth and we also require the spatial uh, derivative of the brightness to be smooth then this term in red is the optical flow term is the brightness constancy we can identify that this is the equation that says um, uh, we've seen before in the brightness constancy slide and ideally we would like this to be zero for trajectories uh, and that are the correct ones because those are the trajectories uh, that satisfy brightness constancy and then the the two terms here in blue are the no event term or the event term basically what they say is that um, you you remember the bottom one is the event generation condition saying that the difference between the brightness at two points in time it should be some uh, threshold times uh, the polarity Yes, and this comes the no term because we events are being processed on a grid, uh, on a voxel grid. So you need to, if there is a voxel with zero events, you need to provide that. Also provides information. The absence of an event in, in that voxel grid it provides information. Basically, it says that events are processed synchronously, right, in this voxel grid. Um, and you need to have this uh, this term to correctly take into, into account. If you were processing only each event as it arrived, as it happened, for example, with the temporal filters that were proposed in uh, by Schierling et al. in HCCB, then there is no uh, no event term because only when events arrive, these are actually processed. And there is nothing happening between uh, events. In the, while they are, if there is no event, nothing is happening. The, the internal state is being updated. And what are the images here on the bottom left? Well, we see the events uh, on the kind of represented with the brightness increment image. On the top right is just a standard camera image for visualization, not used in the algorithm. And the bottom are the two outputs of the of the method. One is the brightness intensity. Uh, so the brightness image or intensity image reconstructed and on the bottom right is the optical flow and now the flow is not being represented using small arrows with direction what they are being represented is with this color color wheel and in the center it's getting dark so the 
the angle represents the direction and the radius represents the, the magnitude of the uh, of the flow and let's see some videos a video of it of some of the results so this is the reconstructed intensity and on the right there was the the flow now here we will see the flow it's faster it's more colored in the in the arms than in the rest of the scene so the camera is moving that's why we see uh, flow everywhere and this algorithm is one of those that actually estimates uh, a dense optical flow so flow for every pixel not just uh, for the pixels that pixels that have events and this is done because the variational uh, terms of the smoothness regularizers are filling in in the regions where there are no events it's trying to interpolate in these regions what the flow would be to be consistent with the flow uh, in the regions where there are events. Um, okay, now let's take a look at uh, optical flow from motion compensation. And there are several algorithms in, in several ways to do this. So what's the assumption? The assumption is that uh, flow is a constant in small space-time volume, similar to kind of what Lucas Canade was assuming, right? And uh, event that basically means that events in the volume, they share the same uh, flow vector. The idea is to find the flow V that uh, best aligns the corresponding events. And we would say why? Well, we've seen that as an edge moves, it triggers event at pixels that it crosses, uh, as we can see on, on the bottom here, in this kind of histogram of uh, accumulated events, histogram of events where dark means uh, the presence of an event and bright means the, the absence of event. Uh, here I'm not plotting polarity. So we can identify that as the camera is moving, there is a, a trail of events. And here I'm just projecting and summing in these uh, events. Um, and this kind of shows up almost like as some people call it blur in the image, but the, the, the events are not blurred, what they are blurring is the, the operation of summing pixel-wise for a short time window. As this uh, edge was moving, it was triggering events. And what we would like to do is that try to uh, undo this motion, so to compensate it to recover the thin edge. So to undo it, basically there is an iterative algorithm. We'll try to estimate the, the best optical flow such that in the end we will get with a sharper image and we have basically uh, warp all the events in this space-time volume to a common location they are lining up so that's the idea um, what are the iteration steps well we are transforming the events uh, events have x y coordinates t is the time and t is the polarity we are transforming them into other set of events um, where we are changing the x, y, and also the time. We want to consider it, and we leave polarity and change. And what is this transformation? Well, it's basically a displacement. We move the events, the x, y coordinate, we move them according to some candidate flow vector, V, and uh, how much we, we, we move it depends on the difference between the current timestamp and a referent timestamp, which could be the timestamp of the first event, the volume. So this is easy, right? We are used to this equation. A space is velocity times time. This is just displacement on the image plane. And then once we have uh, transformed or warped these events, as we call them, then we need to measure how well these warp events align. How can we do it? Well, it depends on the representation. If we use point sets, then we can measure how well they align by using the Euclidean distance between event pairs. Or if we use, as we have seen before, a histogram of, of events, uh, we could measure the contrast or the, the strength of the, of the edges um, or how thick or thin they are. Right? There are many ways that you can measure this. These are focus measures. Um, 
Or if we represent events uh, by their timestamp using something similar to time surfaces, we could try to minimize the average time per pixel. Yeah, there are different ways to do it. So let's look at one of them using histogram of events. And this is a different example. Consider that we have um, this, uh, this image just the, the image is just for visualization we are not going to use the, the image frame um, but consider we have the events coming from this batch and there are we consider three velocities uh, red blue and green and we would like to plot in the velocity space so if this is the optical flow space the velocity in the x direction and the velocity in the in the y direction we would like to plot uh, what is the focus of or a contrast of the histogram um, of events basically this quantity we would like to to see how how blur how yeah how sharp or how blurred this histogram of event is so this is the space and now consider what happens when we warp the events and uh, if we can warp the events according to this velocity um, well Basically, this is the histogram image represented with some other color uh, map, and this is a blurred. We don't see a uh, edge pattern here. If we use now instead of this velocity zero, which was the red velocity, now we use the the velocity in blue, which is closer to the ground truth velocity that is the green. Then we'll have a sharper histogram of events, and if we use the velocity uh, number two, so the green uh, arrow here, the green optical flow, uh, candidate optical flow, then we get the sharpest, which is the one that achieves motion compensation. Well, the idea is that among these three velocities, we would choose the one that has the, the sharpest motion, the sharpest uh, histogram of events as the one that is uh, more closely uh, related to the optical flow and this is a, an example video where we do this for patches of i guess 25 or 20 by 20 pixels and you see the motion corrected patches and uh, and the direction of the flow the size of the of the arrow it's basically the magnitude of the flow the direction is encoded in this color wheel at the bottom right. This is one from a sequence from the event camera data set that we have seen before 2017 in International Journal of Robotic Research. The idea is that this basically this uh, contrast maximization uh, works nice for for patches and there have been extensions for to compute the optical flow on the on the full image plane. So another way to uh, measure motion compensation instead of using histogram of events is interpreting events as point sets. And we have seen this example before when we were looking at features. On the left, you have the space-time uh, view of the, of the event. So X and Y horizontally and time goes up. And um, as events are transformed here, the way they are transformed are with the x coordinate. We are not on the left, but you see that the the time coordinate is not changing to a reference time; it's remaining the same. And what it's changing is the x y coordinates. And what you see on the right are the projections, kind of like a top view of of that uh, space time uh, plot of the events. So basically, these are the x, y coordinates of the warp events. So that's the first step to move them. And well, this is all happening iteratively. And how do you determine how to move? It's because at the same time that you are moving, you are measuring the alignment of the warp events using the Euclidean distance between pairs of events, of warp events. And that's what we can identify here. On the left, inside these parentheses, is one event that has been warped. And on the right, it's another event. And this is with the Two norm is the Euclidean distance, and these are some weights given by the data associations. So this is another way to achieve motion compensation that is here shown on the on the right by using events and representing them as point sets. 
um, before we move on on to uh, learning or data-driven algorithms let's review this uh, model-based algorithm that is trying to estimate optical flow using block matching and block matching is a video processing technique so the idea here is that uh, we would like to reuse uh, well-developed techniques from video processing to estimate motion vectors so in video processing they estimate these motion vectors because they can then predict the intensities in different blocks so patches and uh, basically send out uh, the xy coordinates of the motion uh, vector rather than the entire intensities of the uh, of the block in in the block and that's much more efficient so it's used for compression of video video compression yes so the main idea is that we there are these techniques that where optical flow it's basically can be interpreted as computing a motion vector and uh, for that, we need to, if we want to apply these video processing techniques, we need to come up with an image-like representation. What's the simplest one? Well, then we accumulate events into some so-called slices or event frames. And here, the, the algorithm has three slices, one at time t, where it accumulates uh, the current events. Then it's another slice at time t minus d. So d is the slice duration it's 100 milliseconds for example and there is another slice um, <clears throat> at uh, some other point in the past so the event um, is triggered in this pixel this pixel uh, defines a reference block in the previous slice and then um, you try to match this block to um, some other patch or block of pixels in the previous slice and you all only search in, in a small region around the block that's what makes the, the search very very efficient so you're not searching over the whole image and you can use parallel hardware to do this search then the resulting flow vector is basically the displacement between these uh, two blocks divided by the uh, duration of the the time between the, the slices so how do you define whether one block or one patch here matches or corresponds to another patch in the in the background basically you you use classical measures to such as the uh, sum of absolute differences or the sum of square differences in the end the interpretation is that you are comparing histograms of events this is like a small histogram in space-time around this slice, and this is another histogram of events in space-time. And you are comparing this, this volume of events uh, using uh, some metric, in this case, the sum of absolute distances. Yes, and then the search is very efficient for, for the motion vector because you restrict it to some small area around the current block. And the paper proposes an adaptive slice duration, so called a frame rate, that allows to best handle the slow motions and fast motions. It has been implemented in, in FPGA. Yeah. So let's look at some results. And for that, we have this uh, video on YouTube that is linked at the bottom. And this is just to show that. Um, there are some sequences in the event camera data set where they are over the frames are overexposed but the frames are okay because uh, they are high dynamic range so what it's being represented here are in black and white are the events over gray and then the arrows are the mm, the optical flow and on the left they are colored according to this color wheel so they represent the direction and the size of the arrow represents uh, the magnitude of the flow this is also, for example, estimated a global translation of about 100 pixels per second. In, in case of fast motions, the frames are completely blurred, but uh, the events are not. So this is showing, again, the, the arrows represent the, the optical flow, and it's computed at some points. So it's, it's not an optical. Uh, an algorithm that outputs 
a dense flow. This is uh, output in a, a sparse flow, and there are different algorithms like this is Lucas Canade. It's a variant a variation of of the algorithm. Here is a comparison between these two. When the when there is a rotational motion, you can it's a nice pattern because then you see all the colors, flow vectors in in all directions. What you observe also is that there are no events at the center of rotation, so it's very difficult in this case to estimate um, the optical flow at the at the center of rotation because there is there is a lack of events. And there are more uh, uh, other sequences. This is like a shape sequence from the from the data set, an office sequence, so a bit more natural sequence. This looks like a forward motion, but at the same time, you see how the person is going up and down. That's how you see that the the arrows sometimes change direction. The focus of expansion is, is this point on the image plane where, in principle, if, if you're moving forward, you would see that it seems that the, the vectors of the optical flow emanate from this from this point in the on the image. That's called that's why it's called the focus of expansion. So this is side sideways motion, I guess, on a train. And the flows are flow vectors are mostly horizontal. There is some spurious vectors in different directions, but it's mostly uh, horizontal motion to the right. Yeah, there are more examples in the in the YouTube video. This is another case of a for application to automotive. Uh, and again, this is forward motion. This should be like a focus of expansion somewhere here, but it's difficult to see if the the scene is so far away and the events are accumulated for a short amount of time. Okay, and this was the I guess the last of the model-based method. Then next we will look at uh, data-driven methods. <laughs>